Hold on, of course. Oh, I did do it. The duck. Hey folks, how we're doing? Bad, bad? That many downs? Um, so I gave feedback to folks on their homework. Um, some folks have finished all the homework, which is like this. Some folks have not finished all their homework, which is like this. And some folks have not started their homework, which is like this. Um, so if you uh, if you get my feedback and you say, well, that's just one line, Chris Money, that's not enough feedback. That's mostly because I want to talk to you about it. I want to you know talk to you through the process of going through the work. So in each of your homeworks, I'll identify what was missing. So for example, many of you did the Madeleine constant and you calculate this sum, this double sum, in order to figure out from homework zero how much, uh, how many, uh, how large L can be before you break the computer. And maybe you calculated it once and then you stopped. Um, but maybe you calculated it a bunch of times and you broke the computer and I'd say, good, that's what I wanted you to do. Um, so I'm trying to give you like a little detailed feedback. It's either at the very top of your homework or at the very bottom of your homework, sort of summarizing what I saw there. Um, and you should be able to see which one I commented on just by looking at when it was most recently edited. So if it was edited this weekend and you didn't edit it, that was me writing your comments. Okay. Questions, comments, concerns? People came to office hours today. They got the answers. I didn't bite them. They're still alive. So that's good. Um, if you need help or you have a question, you can always send me a Slack message. Um, you can drop in if you need a time that is not the allotted time. Okay. Okay. Um, so for today's homework, um, we are going to be doing... Wait. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> We're going to be doing this. This might be out of sync. We might all have to slide down. Did anyone finish 8.3? Raise your hand if you started 8.3. Okay, that seems representative. Um, so maybe we'll slide that one down uh, just because we missed, we had a little bit of uh, extra slack there um, when we redid derivatives instead of doing first first order, uh, sorry, ODEs with, right, because this is supposed to be here. Um, so maybe we'll slide that down a little bit and we'll just do this one with the print problem. It's too much. Or I leave it there? Does anyone care? Just leave it. Okay. Okay. So today we're going to talk about differential equations with more than one variable. And the way to solve differential equations with more, more than one variable is not more complicated. It's not a different algorithm, but it's about adapting the algorithm to be responsive to multiple inputs. Um, so we're going to talk, uh, Gonzalo is going to walk us through this today. Is that correct? Okay. Where would you like me to start? Eight point two. Yeah. Yep. Right. So, um, 
Eight point two is about the threshold of breaking the point of variable. So there's going to be a lot of overlap with uh, eight point one because kind of is basically like the same order of operations. Only this time we were just dealing with one dependent variable, which is just like the exact same urgency. Now we're having to deal with um, multiple ones, which they call simultaneous differential equations, which is dx over dt, like dy over dt. You can see in the example right over here how. Now we have x and y acting as dependent variables in different equations. Go down, and we will show you the general form for the first order sum of the differential equation over here, where it basically takes in f of x of uh, all variables together. <clears throat> and well, it uh, also can show that uh, you can also write it on the vector notation. So instead of like taking X and Y, and if you have like a bunch of them, and it can get like really hard to lose track of uh, what exactly like you're working with, you can instead just put like an arbitrary R, so like dr over dt, where R can put X, Y, Z, so on and so forth. Basically kind of like, simplifying the list of variables that you're working with and it's a lot easier to keep track of because like it says in the book that like we start dealing with a lot of complex equations that have like several variables going on at once and it can get overwhelming pretty quickly and the interesting case here is that um like in uh 8.1 we can apply the same rules and and the uh, order of operations to solve these on simultaneous differential equations. And it's basically just um, kind of the same thing. So on 8.31, the example that they have here, they actually show you a Taylor expansion of uh, vector r. So you have the uh, r t plus a equals r t uh, in that code delivery word. And uh, if you have to, uh, go into higher orders they also shows you the you can do newer method on top of it as well and if you notice down when you're using the Taylor expansion to derive the one to it rules it's almost the same as the uh as the first order uh differential equation okay so let's pause here for a second Let's remember a couple things. So this is the Runge-Kutta method. And when you do the Runge-Kutta method in one dimension, okay, you do something like K1 equals H times F of X and T, right? And generally speaking, we can think of F of T, right? You can use some definition and you could call it F and it feeds in X and it feeds in T, right? And then it does some stuff. And what does it give you back? The value of F, F exactly, right. Right, so it gives you F, right? And in particular, you might be a little like touchy and say, well, really F of X, right? That makes sense? So how does this adjust when we have, instead of X, R, which is a variable, and K1, which is a variable? Sorry, a vector. Yeah. So let's write this again. Here's our definition. F, oops, of R now, vector symbol T, does some stuff. And returns what? Okay. And what is F of R? It has to be a vector. That's really important because look up here. This value that we get out is a vector. So this thing here has to return a vector because that's a vector times h and h is a constant. 
So if you're only returning one variable from your new F, you're doing it wrong and it's going to complain, right? Because it's going to expect to assign multiple items and you're only going to assign one. So this is the first big warning that I'll give you today. Down here, it should be something like F of X comma F of Y and so on and so forth, right? And you might have to calculate all of them separately. That's totally okay, right? But then you return them all as a as an array or as a vector. And R is a function of F of X and Y? Yeah, so this is, of course uses the definition that I didn't actually say out loud, which is that R equals X comma Y comma Z sometimes or whatever. As many variables as you want. Because it could be X, Y, T, do whatever you want. Beta, phi. Okay, cool. Everyone loves it? Super easy, right? Super straightforward? Yeah. Okay, it's a straightforward transition, but you'll see when you implement it, you're like, oh, that's actually, that's more straightforward than I thought. It's gonna look weird now, but thankfully the computer will do all the hard work. Okay, so as long as we understand this intellectual transition from one dimension to multiple dimensions, the computer will keep track of everything else. So if you could do it in one dimension, you can do it in 10. Oh shit, what? Okay, so the hardest part is knowing how to do it in one. Go ahead. So it's what kind of like computing you want to see. So that's what, when you're doing like the original one with F of X, F of X will just give you like a value of that function. But when you're doing the F of R, it's basically taking like each individual component and giving it back each value of each component. So yeah, you have to feed in all of the locations, all the information that it needs. You might need X, Y, Z, and T, for example, in order to calculate only three derivatives that you pass back, right? But before, you maybe needed the position and the time to pass back one derivative, right? So generally speaking, you might need lots of stuff in, but you need to pass it whatever derivatives are required for this H times K. Right? right or no? Yes? No. Yes. Let's scroll up for a second. We're going to look at this exactly. So here is um, a real example. Okay? So this first one on the left would be f of x. And I would just calculate that using the values of x and y that I just fed to it. This would be a number, like 0.7. Right? And then this one here would be f of y. And I would calculate that using t, y, and x, which are all changing. Omega will imagine is constant. And then I would simply return f of x, comma, f of y. Cool. Reasonable? OK. In practice, it'll make more sense. Um, you want to continue this all? So then you could see like the equation from the method or the one kind of method that we put up right here. Like I said, they were very similar to the original one. And they're using the same arrays to represent vector. Good. Okay, so here's the example, right? You are you gonna work through the example? Well, I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah cool. So like if you look at the example 8.5 right here, where it's uh, working out a simultaneous overtime for the married employee, uh, you could definitely look at the similarities, like where to pass uh, example. So from here, in this case, we have a finite t from 0 to 10, and in our case, our uh, omega is at 1 with the initial condition. You'll basically just be pulling like, the same uh, imports from, and then adding the values. The range right over here, it's like almost very similar to the eight point kind of like what I'm trying to get And then at the bottom, putting out the arrays, the, the key points, or the handling lists for X and Y. And then right over there is where you have the whole like wrong cut and the case on the bottom. And then it's just really straightforward with this one. Okay, so let's pause for a second. Let's just break down a couple really important key parts. So now you've become experts in coding. 
right? So what's missing from this? Why would I send this homework back to you? Comments, no comments telling you what is going on. But I like the structure, right? So I would expect this to be in its own box. And of course it would have your name and what date you're working on this, et cetera. And then I put this in its own box because that way I could adjust it if I needed to. And then I would put this in its own box where I make all the data and I'd put the plotting in its own box, right? That way each set of individual thoughts can be worked on individually. If I put them all together, let's say it takes me 15 minutes to make the data, right? I make the data and then I try to change the plot a little bit. If the plot and the data are in the same box, then I have to wait another 15 minutes to recreate the data, you see? So if I make the data once, leave it and never touch it again. So similarly, I, if there was a, you know, if I had to read in a file, I would put it in the same location that I created any definitions, right? Okay. And let's look here at this definition. Okay, so that looks very similar to something. Right? Okay, so here I said definition of R, and that's what they say up here, here. And then I said, do something, do some stuff, and return an array which has these both, right? So we can just start with this type of understanding. And of course, naturally, we could expand to three dimensions by just adding a Z, right? Or uh, keep going, I don't know, W, X, wait, I don't know how to do my, <laughs> my letters. <laughs> anyway, you get the idea, right? You could keep going on and on. Um, notice a couple things that are really important here. Here, I am not bringing in X, Y, Z separately. Why is that? The X, Y, Z we need to be in LA. R is the position that they can go over the Good, yeah. So if I want to look down here, right, and I see this is K1 and this is R, if you ignore all this other stuff, right, just look at this piece here, which is our Runga cutout. You'll notice that it just has R and T. And the only reason why F of R and T requires a raise is because the definition requires a raise. So if I simply leave it like this, and I don't include X, Y, Z here in the call, I just leave it as R, then this is generalizable to as many dimensions as I want. I can use it for one dimensional, I can use it for 15 dimensional, and the only place I have to change it is here, right? So up here, I could change how many dimensions. I could say R is two dimensions, zero, one, okay? Or I could remove that line entirely. And I could make this one dimension. I could not even say this at all and just have where I used to have X, I could have R. And I could do my differential and I could return one value, right? Okay. In practice, this will make more sense. So right now it feels very abstract, but we're gonna start with something like this and then we're gonna apply it. And you'll see, oh my God, I could totally do homework too in like two seconds because all you have to do is change the definition of the differential, right? Okay. Actually, I think that's it, right? Okay. Yeah, perfect. Okay, no, and, and honestly, this is where we start, right? For the next couple weeks, it is not a complicated thing of finding new algorithms and, and that. It's about applying these different physical conditions, okay? So you want to be brushing up on your coding skills. You want to make sure that you're understanding loops and how to manage arrays because where we're headed to is creating an array that, that represents a physical system and then updating every value in it with time, with respect to some physical parameter changing, et cetera, so that you can model something really cool. Okay, so Easter's almost here, right? People know what Easter is? What is the um, mascot of Easter? The bunny, good. 
So today we will be killing bunnies or growing them, depending on how we feel. So this is the lock of Volterra equations. And this is the mathematical model of a predator-prey interaction between two biological species. And we're gonna call the prey the rabbits and uh, the foxes the predators. You can choose other options. If you want, you can do grass for the prey and the bunnies can be the predators, I don't mind. But in either case, we are gonna be thinking about one population decreasing due to the abundance of the other. So you have two coupled, meaning that they rely on one another, coupled differential equations, okay? Okay, so we're gonna write a fourth order Runge-Kutta method, and we're gonna plot this with a time uh, varying phenomenon, okay? So what I recommend you do strongly here, start with the exercise or the example that you just saw, sorry, not the exercise either copy that or code it for yourself and run it and see if you understand how it works, okay? And after you've understood how it works, I want you to make the following changes. Consider this equation as your f of x and this equation as your f of y, okay? And then you have to set all the initial parameters and whatnot, but you'll get a very different behavior than the driven pendulum. Does that make sense? That was really quick. So like 20 minutes for the talking. Okay. Are we going to cruise through today? Everyone's energized? No one's energized. Just me from four coffees. Okay. So why don't you break up into groups of people you haven't worked with before so you can learn some new techniques and styles, practice your communication skills, make a new friend? Huh? Huh? All right. Don't all talk at once.